You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Hello and welcome to another edition of the PRA podcast. My name is David Russell, and I'm here with my co-host, David Palmer. We, we, we will debate annihilation at some point on here, will. man. We will, but first we got to do a Christmas special. But um, today I'm going to be giving over the mic to you and letting you introduce our, our guests here because we got some aw- three awesome guests here, and we're doing a debate on King James onlyism, right? That would be correct, yes. All right, man. Well, I'm going to hand it over to you, man. Take the reins. All right. So, uh, yeah, first let me just introduce our guest moderator that we have with us today. Uh, This would be Eric Sigmund. Uh, Actually, this debate is set up. It's due to him. He said, uh, hey, I know uh, this guy who uh, argues for King James Olsen. You should get him on to uh, debate it with someone. And so, uh, and then that was Andrew. So I uh, contacted Andrew, asked if he was interested in Andrew Timothy for a while. And so I was like, uh, you know, let's have these guys debate. It turns out they've actually debated this once before. So this is kind of a part two. But yeah, uh, Eric on here uh, is, uh, he's an assistant pastor, uh, church in Ohio, and is pursuing a master's degree in Christian ideas at Luther Rice. Uh, So, Let's just uh, introduce him. Uh, anything else that you would like to add to that, Eric? Um, no, that's, that's, that's about it. Um, I think that's good. So. All right. And then uh, our second guest then is uh, Andrew, Andrew Sluter, and he's a pastor of Bible Baptist Church. Uh, anything you would like to add to that, Andrew? No, sir. All right, and then finally we've got Timothy, Timothy Berg, who uh, you know studies this bit quite in depth. Uh, anything you would like to say about yourself? Uh, no, I love the topic, love to talk about it. Uh, I'm sure we'll get more into some of that as we chat. All right, well then let's uh, just uh, dive right into it. We'll uh, give you both 10 minute opening statements here. So uh, we'll let Andrew go first to present his affirmative case. All right. Well, I won't take the whole 10 minutes, but thank you for having me on. Uh, In case anybody doesn't uh, know, uh, I am of the strong King James only persuasion. Uh, I do think that the King James Bible is inerrant, infallible, and is the very inspired words of God. Uh, I think the issue comes down to the concept of preservation. Uh, I think that God promised preservation of his words in Psalms 12, 6, and 7. Now, if you have a modern translation, all barring except, I think, the New King James, uh, you don't have a promise of uh, the preservation of words. Uh, All the modern translations tinker with that promise and uh, makes it the poor and the needy, not the actual words of God there. But I do think that God promised to preserve his word through all generations. And I do think that the King James Bible is that promise of preservation. Now, what we'll have tonight is you'll see two viewpoints for everybody that's going to be watching. Um, You'll see two viewpoints. You'll see one viewpoint of a final authority. It's always going to be a case of final authority, but I believe the final authority lies within a book. Um, Mr. Berg, although he would say he believes it lies with a book, uh, it's not with one book. It's with multiple authorities multiple ways and ultimately ultimately it comes down to what do you believe is the final authority is it our brain is it what we think is it in a bunch of different places or can it be found in one place what i'll do is i want to read uh off the bat and this is where I'll, i'll close out i won't take the whole 10 minutes like i said but the creed of the alexandrian cult uh dr peter s ruckman wrote this Uh, some years ago, and I think it holds very true to what we're talking about. Uh, Here's the creed of the Alexandrian cult, those who take their line of manuscripts from Alexandria, 
and those that hold to the modern translations. Number one, they believe that there is no final authority but God. That sounds good off the get-go, but we'll dissect that statement. Since God is a spirit, there is no final authority that can be seen, heard, read, or handled. Since all books are material, there is no book on this earth that is the final and absolute authority on what is right and what is wrong, what constitutes truth and what constitutes error. There was a series of writings one time, which if they had all been put into a book as soon as they were written the first time, would have constituted an infallible and final authority by which to judge truth and error. So everybody would agree that the original autographs, which we do not have, they don't exist anymore, were without error. Uh, but I think for our conversation last time, I'm not entirely sure if Timothy, and maybe he can clarify in his opening remarks or sometime later on, but uh, over this is one of the issues, Isaiah, excuse me, Mark 1, 2, where it talks about the prophets said, and then it gives two prophecies, one from Isaiah, one from Malachi, but in the ESV and all the modern translations, it uses the word Isaiah. Well, one of those phrases never found in Isaiah. I don't, I, from last time I can remember, Mr. Berg had said that uh, even if that was in the originals, it would not have been an error. So maybe he can clarify that later. But if they all would have been put in one time, it would have constituted an infallible and final authority by which to judge truth and error. However, this series of writings was lost, and the God who inspired them was unwilling to preserve their content through Bible-believing Christians at Antioch, where the first Bible teachers were, where the first missionary trip originated, and where the word Christian originated, but rather chose to almost preserve them through Gnostics and philosophers from Alexandria, Egypt, even though call, God called his son, his people, Jacob and Joseph's bones all out of Egypt. So there are two streams of Bibles in the Alexandrians' minds, the most accurate, though of course there is no final absolute authority for determining truth and error. It is a matter of preference, are the Egyptian translations from Alexandria, Egypt, which are the almost originals, but not quite. The most inaccurate translations were those that were brought about by the German Reformation and the worldwide missionary movement of the English-speaking people, the Bible that Billy Sunday, R.A. Torrey, D.L. Moody, Charles Finney, C.H. Spurgeon, Whitfield, Wesley, and the like all used. But we can tolerate those if those who believe in them will tolerate us. After all, since there is no absolute and final authority that anyone can read, teach, preach, or handle, the whole thing is a matter of preference. You may prefer what you prefer, and we will prefer what we prefer. Let us live in peace, and if we cannot agree on anything or everything, let us all agree on one thing, that there is no final, absolute, written authority of God anywhere on the earth. Now, as harsh as that may seem, and I'm sure, I'm sure that there would be uh, tons of people who would read that and think it's harsh, but that is ultimately what we are getting down to. Is there a written final authority on planet Earth today? I would say yes. The other side would say no. And so as, as, as genuine as people may be in their defense of modern translations in the Alexandrian line, we'll see here tonight that I just don't think that you can be genuine in holding to those lines and saying that the, you have the word of God in your hand. So two, li two thoughts, two, two lines of thought. There is a final authority, and there is not a final authority. All right, that's all I have for my or excuse me, my opening statement. Hey, Andrew, would you just end your uh, your 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 segment here with the sign that's behind you? Sure, love them to Jesus. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much. All right, and love and always tells the truth. All right. Ooh. All right, uh, then I think uh, we'll let Timothy go into his uh, 10. Okay. Now, I put a couple slides together. Let me flip this on and make sure that you can see that there. Do you see my screen with slides? Did that work? I can't hear you guys. Did that work? Do you see my screen now? 
I've been coming through. Okay. All right. So you can see that heading there, why we should not use only the King James Bible? Yes, I can. Yep. Got it. Okay. So the question before us is why you should, should not only use the King James Bible. Andrew's presented a case that you should, and I will actually rebut that case in our rebuttal rather than talk about it now. But I want to present my case for why you should not only use the King James Bible or why you shouldn't be only King James only. And what I want to do is present that case using nothing but a King James Bible. I understand when people sometimes say, I don't know Greek, I don't know Hebrew, I don't know the manuscripts. Uh, all I use is my King James Bible. That's fine. I want to show you why if you used nothing but a King James Bible, you would, in fact, expect what I call textual absolutism. And I'm going to do that uh, in three quick strokes. I'm going to explain three positions on the text of the Bible and then present two arguments from the King James Bible for why I think Jesus and the apostles landed at the third position. So very quickly, positions on the text of the Bible, and we mentioned this before last uh, debate, Andrew and I, uh, I think the first view is what I would call textual absolutism. King James onlyism is a form of that. It claims I've got one particular copy or text or translation that is the final absolute authority that everything else should be judged by, and don't change it, don't touch it. In the words of the King James translators, they cannot abide to hear of altering. Another view that's out there that's very common um, is a view I'd call textual skepticism, which says we have no idea what the Bible is originals are lost. Um, we can't recover them. Someone like Bart Ehrman would come along and say, so therefore we have no idea what God originally said in scripture. I'd like to point out that both of those views have what I call an abracadabra Bible. That is, they think of the Bible like a magic spell. Uh, ancient, you've seen movies of some ancient story. Somebody finds a, a magic spell. It's written in Latin. They don't even know what it means. But they've got to say it exactly right for it to work. And if you cut off the corner of a little piece of paper and it's missing a word, then the spell doesn't work anymore. And both of those traditions think of the Bible somewhat like that. Understand it or not? Oh, we can't be certain. But we've got to have the exact words. And if we don't have the exact words, we've lost the Bible. We've lost God's word. I'd like to propose a third position, what I think is the biblical position. And it's what I call textual confidence. And it says that God's word is too strong to be silenced. It's not an abracadabra Bible. It's not a magic spell where if you get a word or two wrong, all of a sudden it's corrupted and it's not God's word. God's word is more powerful than that. So I want to do that in two arguments. And that argument is going to be first a biblical theology framework from the King James Bible. And then secondly, what I call a biblical history framework from the King James Bible. And again, I'm not building the case the way I normally would with a, if I'm sitting down and thinking through things and studying. I'm saying, what could I say if the only access to God's revelation that I had was a King James Bible? So let me make these two points. First, a biblical theology framework, and I'm going to just skim through this real quickly. If we read our King James Bible closely and carefully, we'd get a good sketch of, of an overview of biblical theology that teaches that God's created the world perfect. Sin corrupted the world, and so now we live in a world where moth and rust doth now corrupt. God's promised to restore it. He speaks scripture into a fallen world. The Bible tells us in the King James that the Bible was given by inspiration of God, and that means transmission happens in a fallen world. However, that fallenness doesn't silence the word of God, so that even though, yes, every copy is going to be imperfect, scribes are going to make mistakes, translators are going to make mistakes, Things are going to get lost. The exact wording won't show up in any particular copy. But God still speaks in every copy. He preserves his word. So I would say if we took that biblical framework and asked which of these positions does it fit with? Well, skepticism admits that there's a fall, recognizes manuscripts get lost, destroyed, mixed up. But it denies the power of God's word. Absolutism recognizes the power of God's word, and I commend Andrew for that. I commend him for his faith, his affirmation of scripture, but really denies the effects of the fall upon the transmission of scripture. Textual confidence holds both of those things together. So that's my first argument, biblical theology. But secondly, I want to trace out what I'd call a biblical history framework from the King James. That is, if we were to ask the question, what Bible would Jesus use if he were here today? That should tell us what our position should be. 
And we ask that question by asking, what Bible did Jesus use? And if we're going to stick with just the King James, what we, could we say about the Bible Jesus used using just the King James Bible? If we were to look at the King James translators, they have several sections where they address that question. They were convinced that Jesus used the Septuagint, the LXX, and they were convinced that the Septuagint was full of errors. Now, my case doesn't depend on that reality. The case that I'm about to make, it doesn't matter whether Jesus used a Septuagint, a Hebrew Bible, an Aramaic translation, or even if everybody spoke English and he used an English Bible. I just want to make the case that using nothing but a King James Bible, you would be forced to reject King James onlyism. Let me show you what I mean. If we took a King James Bible and we opened it to Psalm 51 and verse 4, the King James says that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. But when Paul quotes this text in the King James in Romans 3, 4, he uses a different translation of it, one which has changed the wording. It now says, justified in thy sayings, and that thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. Paul is not using a King James Bible according to the King James Bible. In fact, sometimes Paul uses multiple different translations. So the King James Bible says in Deuteronomy 25, not to muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. Paul quotes that in 1 Timothy 5.18, but his translation says, don't muzzle the ox, that treadeth out the corn. And then he quotes the same text in his letter to the Corinthians, and in the King James, uses a different translation, which adds the phrase, and so now says, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Sometimes he's an ESV type guy, sometimes he's an NIV type guy. He'll use multiple different translations. In fact, Paul and Peter sometimes use different translations of the same text. Isaiah 28, you can see there on your screen, I've underlined the sections that are changed. When Paul quotes the text in Romans 9.33, has different wording. But Peter quotes the same text in 1 Peter 2.6 and has yet a different wording. They're both quoting the Bible. Neither one of them is quoting the King James Bible. And both of their translations disagree with each other. In fact, even in the same book in the King James Bible, the author can use two different translations. So the author of Hebrews quotes Psalms 95 several times in his text, but when he quotes verse 11 in verse 7, he quotes it as, they shall not enter into my rest. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. He quotes the same text in chapter 4 and verse 3, and it's a different translation of it. As I have sworn in my rest, in my wrath, if they shall not enter into my rest. So here we have the same author, even in the same book, quoting the biblical text in two different translations. Jesus used a Bible, according to the King James, that sometimes changes ye's and these. You'll hear King James only guys regularly upset about ye's and these. Well, the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6 says, ye shall not tempt the Lord your God. But when Jesus quotes it in Matthew 4 in the King James, the Bible he's using says it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The Bible Jesus uses is sometimes more of a dynamic translation. So the King James says, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God in Deuteronomy 6. But Jesus' translation, which he quotes to Satan at the temptation, says it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. There's a phrase added. In fact, in our King James Bible, we can see Jesus quote the same text at two different times in two different forms. Instead of unhouse of prayer, which the King James says in Isaiah 56, Jesus quotes the text in Matthew 21 as the house of prayer. And then in Luke 19, when he quotes it, the phrase that said shall be called has been changed to is. Sometimes Jesus uses the Bible according to the King James, which deletes clauses. And that same story as he's quoting scripture to Satan, the text that in the King James Bible says, by every word you'll live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. Well, in the King James Bible, when he quotes that, Lord has become God. And the second time he quotes that in Luke 4, the whole phrase, that proceedeth out of the mouth of, has disappeared. In fact, in the paradigmatic story, when Jesus stands up in Nazareth and preaches the one and only narrative where we can see Jesus stand, take, read a text, and preach from it, well, what Bible did Jesus preach from? Well, if we take a King James Bible in Isaiah 61 and compare it to the text of Luke chapter 4 where Jesus is preaching, we can see that in the King James, the word God and the Lord have been removed in Jesus' Bible. His says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, upon me, God is missing, because he, the Lord is missing, hath anointed me. In fact, 
Jesus' translation has an entirely added phrase, the recovering of the sight of the blind, and virtually no six words in that text as he quotes it are exactly the same as the King James. There's regular changes there that you can walk through on your own. What's evident then in these examples, and we could make a hundred more just like them, I just picked a few, what's evident is that even if you don't know Greek or don't know Hebrew, that's fine. I don't demand that you be a Hebrew scholar. If all you've got is a King James Bible, you can read the King James Bible and it would become abundantly clear that number one, Jesus and the apostles were not textual absolutists and were not textual skeptics. Number two, that Jesus and the apostles did not always use the King James Bible or whatever text you want to say would be like the King James Bible. And therefore, that any demand that we only use the King James Bible turns out at the end of the day to condemn the Savior that we both love and worship. I would suggest that the problem's not with Jesus. It's not with what he did. It's not with Paul and it's not with Peter. The problem is with this presupposition of an abracadabra Bible that says any change to the King James Bible is a change to the word of God. And I'd say that's fundamentally unbiblical. And I could prove that to you using nothing but a King James Bible. And that is my presentation. All right, very good. Um, before we get into uh, rebuttals here, uh, I just had a, a clarifying question that I wanted to ask Andrew, and if either you, David, or you, uh, Eric, have a question uh, for clarification, that would be fine right now. I uh, just wanted to ask you, when you said there were two streams, pure, Um, then there were like two families, or, or you all have. I can't hear you. What, what you, you say to Is anybody else having the same problem? Yeah, he, he's breaking up. I can't hear what he said. Oh, I'm sorry. I was asking who streams were. Do what now? All what? Am I frozen? Well, you're not. You're not frozen. You're cutting in and out real bad. Like I don't even know what your question was. I'm sorry. I, I was asking if you could tell us what the two streams are. The two strands. I, I think he's referring to this further clarification on the uh, Alexandrian from the manuscript. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So the two family of families of manuscripts would be the Alexandrian line of manuscripts and the Antiochian line of manuscripts. There's also a a third. Some some people believe in a third. I lean that way. Uh, the Western family of manuscripts, and I'll get into that a little bit later on, actually. But um, you have two lines of manuscripts from Antioch and Alexandria uh, that follow, you know, the Antiochian line would come through uh, and produce the King James, and then the Alexandrian would come through the West Cotton Hort, uh, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, and will, uh, would produce all the modern uh, English Bibles that you see today. Okay, thanks. And, uh, okay, and did anyone else have any questions? Okay. And um, let's just another question for Andrew. So, um, so as it pertains to the Alexandrian branch of manuscripts, you think that there are certain people throughout time that have corrupted the word of God? And a lot of people will say origin was influential in corrupting the word of God in Alexandria. Um, is, is that true? Is that what you hold to? That there are certain people who have corrupted the word of God in history. Uh, no, particularly in Alexandria. I know a lot of people will, a lot of King James only else would say that Origen was responsible for most of the corruption in the Alexandria manuscripts. Is that something that you would hold to? Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially, and I don't know Origen specifically, um, but I would definitely hold that through the Alexandrian line that there was a definite corruption of the Word of God, for sure. Okay.
Sorry, guys. Well, now we're in the 30-minute uh, uh, cross-examination, and you guys can kind of, like, guide yourselves in that. We'll just ask clarifying questions if we need to. Oh, are, are we not doing, like, a direct five-minute rebuttal to each, or? Okay, you want to do, yeah, the, okay, yeah. We can do rebuttals first. Uh, I mean, it's whatever you want to do. I'm fine with whatever. Uh, go ahead. Rebuttals are, are fine. Yeah, absolutely. Start with your rebuttal. Okay, yeah, so I didn't want to mentioned at all what Andrew had said in my presentation because I was just making a positive presentation. Uh, but in terms of rebuttal, and I don't even think I would take five minutes fully to do this, but he read to us the creed of the Alexandrian cult and made the case that has uh, been associated with Peter Ruckman for a long time. And I, I respect that. Again, I, I want to say I deeply respect the fact that Andrew, I am convinced, is trying to uphold the authority of Scripture. I can see that passion in his heart. I affirm that passion. I believe in it, but what I think happens is that desire to uplift the authority of Scripture becomes trans uh, be becomes uh, transmitted into this idea of upholding one particular form of the text as the authority. Mm -hmm. So he presents this absolutist position that only the King James is the final authority, and what happens then is he ends up agreeing with the skeptics. What Peter Ruckman said in that statement and what he said is essentially. The originals have been lost, so we have no idea what the Bible originally said, so we've just got to trust our King James Bible. But those two things aren't connected. What he's ultimately saying is, we've lost the Bible, we have no way to know what it said, so we'll just pick a particular form and make that the authority. I, I could make that exact same rhetorical move and say, we have no idea what the original said, so I'll just pick the NIV. That'll be my final authority. But that doesn't ultimately work. Because just picking something to be your authority doesn't actually give it any authority. The view that I've sketched out, I think, is a higher view of Scripture. And I urge us to it not because I'm a Bible corrector, not because I don't believe in a final authority, not because I've been affected by some heretical uh, Alexandrian text, but because I think that view of Scripture is weak. That view of Scripture has a magical abracadabra Bible where if you've changed some wording, you suddenly don't have the Bible anymore. I'd say that the... Uh, Alexandrian cult presentation there is suggesting a view of scripture that's weak and that ultimately can't hold up to the world in which we live as sketched out in biblical theology. So that's, I don't know if that was what three minutes, four minutes, but that's uh, my rebuttal. All right, Andrew, for your five minute rebuttal. Okay, re really quick before I give it, I don't know if this, I don't know who I'm supposed to be looking at. I'm looking, all, my whole screen is the guy in the striped long sleeve shirt so uh i don't know if I, I, yeah yeah that's so fine okay is that okay i just want to make yeah. sure what anything on my end yeah i, I yeah. mean he's fine to look at i just i just didn't know if it was <laughs> you can jump anyway. into a grid view if you'd like okay i'll start my i'll go ahead and start my, my five minute rebuttal Here's the thing. It's absolutely correct that we do not have the originals and we don't know what they say. To say, though, that we've just picked the King James and that, that, you know, he made it sound like it was some arbitrary decision that we just picked one out and said, this is the one. And that couldn't be any further from the truth. The reality of it is, is that the King James has was translated uh, in, in by the 54 of the smartest men the time they were using is the King James is an eclectic text. They were using texts that they were familiar with. They were using ancient. I mean, uh, we talk about, you know, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus want to boast about being, you know, the oldest, but I mean, we're going all the way back to manuscripts, you know, the Peshitta and all that kind of stuff. Uh, even the, and we'll get into it in a little bit, even the Latin Vulgate um, has, has verses that are completely left out of the other two uh, of the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, but they're in the Latin Vulgate, which was done in 380, which is right there in the, mi uh, the midst of those other, uh, of those other two, two texts. So what you have is, is you don't have the King James just ar arbitrarily being picked out. You have the King James over time. Uh, you have the King James um, over time being able to, um, hang on just a second, folks. Somebody's trying to. All right, we're good. 
I'm in my church building. I thought somebody was trying to come in the back door. It may just be my family trying to get in. I apologize. What you have is the King James Bible uh, has been the established standard. All the modern translations that come out, every single one of them compared to the King James. They always go back to the King James. And since we don't know what the originals say, we have to now look and say, okay, is there a Bible that we can hold in our hands and say, this is the Word of God? The Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 5, every Word of God is pure. Okay, you have the promise of pre preservation in Psalms 12, 6, and 7, that the words would be preserved. So what we have to ask ourselves is, are the modern translations, the differences between those modern translations and the King James, are they significant enough to make a, you know, to pitch a fit about? Are they significant enough to, to say that, you know what, this actually is a corruption? You know, when you have these modern translations being based off only two manuscripts and the rest of them being based on tons of manuscripts that we have. That's why the text for Sebastian and that line is the majority text. Then you really have to look, okay, are we going to, oh, for example, a, a great analogy is this. If I came into a comic book convention and I don't, I don't get into that stuff, but if I came into a comic book convention and I said, okay, I am going to, uh, hand you a copy of, of, of Spider-Man. It's, it's an old copy of Spider-Man. And in this one, uh, the girlfriend, I forget her name. Was it Lois? Who, who's the girlfriend in Spider-Man? Um, Mary Jane. Mary, the one that dies in the other one. I can't remember. Anyway. With Stacy. <laughs> huh? With Stacy. Okay, there you go. Uh, she doesn't die. But this is an absolute, this is not a fake. This is an absolute, there's only two on planet Earth. I know all the rest of them say this, you know, 500 and something other ones say this, but these two are, are the ones. You would say, okay, if there's only one or two, then they're obviously faked. This isn't anything special. That's exactly what you have with the Bible manuscript evidence. Uh, the overwhelming case of, of manuscripts that we have support the King James, not the modern translations. Uh, so that's really where the issue lies, and uh, and we'll get into all more of that, I'm sure, uh, in further on in the debate. Thank you, guys. Uh, let's go into our 30-minute uh, conversation time. Uh, we'll lead off with you, Andrew, if you'd like to give us a start. Okay. Um, I guess – where I would go to uh, in asking Timothy, you know, as far as the manuscripts, what in the Alexandrian manuscripts, specifically the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, would you say is superior to the Texas Receptus? Why would you think that they are superior? Oh, uh, sure. Um, I would think that any manuscript is immediately superior to the Textus Receptus text. The Textus Receptus text... Um, and it's interesting because I intentionally built an argument that didn't have anything to do with the printed text or its history and use nothing but the Bible. Um, but your argument's moving into that history. So that's fine. We can talk about the history. Uh, the Textus Receptus text is an eclectic text that's not based on any one manuscript and doesn't agree with any manuscript. Um, it certainly is not supported by the vast majority of manuscripts. Some of its readings have zero manuscript support. Um, and, and as a result, there's nothing wrong with an eclectic uh, text. Every, every text, essentially, except for a diplomatic Bible, is an eclectic text. It borrows readings from different manuscripts. But the TR is an eclectic text, the first edition of which was created by Erasmus. And it's about 90%. I'm, I'm making up a number here. It, it's largely Byzantine, but it borrows some Western readings, usually without really good rationale. And then sometimes it has what I would call Erasmian innovations, readings that just innovated and started with Erasmus that don't have any support in any manuscript. Now that text went through a variety of different editions, depending on how you count, maybe 30. Uh, the King James translators didn't use any particular one edition of the Textus Receptus text, but borrowed readings from different editions so that the text behind the King James Bible is even more eclectic and even less well-grounded. So yeah, I would prefer any manuscript over the TR in terms of just its stability of text, the manuscript has a, a history behind it of being used. The TR is an, uh, a combination of readings that just didn't exist until 1516. Never in the history of church of the church for 2,000 years or for 1,500 years 
did that text exist, that combination of readings exist until 1516. So it's the only way it's not inferior is if you believe that God was inspiring or supernaturally moving Erasmus to know which readings to pick. Now, if you believe that, then you could say, yeah, it's a superior text. But you certainly can't say it's a superior text because it's preserved. Well, preserve means to keep something the same. That text didn't keep the text the same. That text made the text different. That particular form of the text with that particular combination of readings just didn't exist until 1516. It's not preserving the form of the text that was always there. It's creating a new form of the text. So you can't say it's the authority and I believe in preservation. You really have to choose, in my opinion, you have to choose one or the other, if that makes sense. I hope that answers your question. It does. Is there any way in the world that I could get to look at Timothy since I'm, I'm we're talking back and forth? Oh, can you not see me? No, no, that's what I was trying to say earlier. I'm 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 looking the full screen is the is is the guy in the long sleeve shirt, striped shirt here. Can you guys see me? The rest of you? Yeah, I could see you just fine. What you'll need to do, Andrew, is go to uh your settings here up in the top right hand corner. There should be something that looks like a box with some things on the outside. Go down and hit grid view and float. Yeah, it's it's both of them are that way, huh. and I it it was on the grid view, but I didn't I didn't touch anything, and and about I don't know twenty minutes ago, it just automatically uh, decided to square in on 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 this guy here on on uh on David, right? Yeah. Huh. I mean, that's, Try clicking uh, on uh, Timothy's icon, like on yeah, Timothy's I tried, picture. I, I, tried, I tried that as well. Huh. I don't know. Okay. I can. I guess I'll just have to live with it. I'm sorry. I didn't even realize you couldn't see me. No, oh, I, I was can't see all those beautiful faces at you too. <laughs> Well, no, I can't see only only him. All right. Um, so my my problem with that would be though is you have you have texts that agree though with the Texas, for example, the Peshitta and the old Syriac. I mean, to ignore those would be. I mean, you have those manuscripts that do line up with the TR. And again, no. every text. Every text is eclectic, but every, you have, go ahead. I was going to say, yes, every text is eclectic, but no, the Syriac, the old Syriac and the Peshitta do not agree with the TR, the, not even remotely close. Anyone who in, says in what, that just. In, in what places? Uh, take any number of places. So um, the Syriac Peshitta actually is translated into English in a project that's called the, the Antioch Bible. They had a copy of it at SBL. Uh, the other day that I was leafing through, it's like a 35 volume set, really awesome, beautiful diglot with the Syriac text on one side and an English translation of it on the other. But it's it's not even remotely like the TR. Uh, I, forgive me, I'm, I'm going off the top of my memory, so I can't remember for sure, but I'm almost confident it doesn't have the story of the woman caught in adultery, doesn't have 1 John 5, 7, doesn't have Acts 8, 37. In fact, there are several, and I'm just going off my memory, but if I'm remembering correctly, there are several New Testament books that weren't even included in the Syriac canon. There are several entire books of the New Testament that were not part of those translations that you just mentioned. So to say they agree with the TR, that's just. Well, so, that's so let me ask you this: Do you well, let me ask you this? Do you think then that the the TR or the okay? Let me ask you this: For example, all the verses left out in the ESV, and I know you would say they're not left out because they're not in you know the Vatican or Sinaiticus, whatever. Would you say then that those were added to the TR? For example, where do you, where do you think that those verses came from? Do you think that the oldest manuscripts available just did not have those verses in them? Sure. So that's a really good question. And it actually comes down to every single individual verse being different. Every textual variant has its own history and its own story. Um, and arises in different ways. So if you just start with the TR as the standard, then you might think all the variants of the TR are the same. But actually, every every variant has 
a separate story of where it came from, how it got into the text, uh, what caused it to be created, what caused it, if it's in the TR and not in another text, what caused it to be in the TR and not to be in another one. So there's a separate story behind each. Let me actually pull up some images and I can show you a, a story of like, say, Acts 837. Would that be okay? Sure, I can't see any of it, but that's fine. Oh, that's right. Well, never mind. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to show it to you anyway. Uh, so we'll, we'll put a link in there to a blog I wrote a long time ago about Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, because that's a great example of a verse that you would say is missing in the ESV and missing in the NIV, uh, but present in the King James Bible. So what's the story there? What happened? Well, in that uh, blog post, I shared the data from every single Greek New Testament manuscript, continuous text Greek New Testament manuscript that we have. And the reading that's found in the TR is actually only found in one Greek New Testament manuscript. Now, there are about 50 or 55, something like that. I'm just going off my memory. Uh, about 50 or 55 manuscripts that do have some form of Acts 8.37. All the rest of the Greek manuscripts agree with the NIV and the ESV there. So how did it come to be in the TR? Well, we can actually see. The manuscript, I think it's 2815, but I don't have it in front of me, so I can't say for sure. We'll post the blog link. We can, oh no, it's 2816. Uh, we can see a manuscript that doesn't have Acts 837 in the text, but it's penciled in the margin by the scribe from the Latin text. Well, Erasmus, when he was creating the TR, he flat out says in his notes, I don't find, I'm paraphrasing him, he says, I don't find verse 37 in my Greek manuscripts. But I find it in the Latin text, and I think it's supposed to be part of the text. So he creates that Greek text by translating the Latin into the Greek. And he says, I have seen it in the margin of one manuscript. He mentions that manuscript. But interestingly, the form of the text that he puts into the TR is not the form that's in that manuscript. The form he puts into the TR is his own translation of the Latin Vulgate. So it creates a brand new form of the Greek text that has never existed anywhere except in one Greek New Testament manuscript. And now you have a text of the book of Acts that's mostly like the Greek manuscripts that he used, but that also has this reading that doesn't have anything to do with Greek manuscripts that he said is not in the Greek manuscripts. And so now you've got a new form of the text of Acts that's eclectic and that didn't exist until Erasmus made that choice. So that's the story of how one variant comes into the text. But again, every variant's different. The evidence behind it is different. The story behind it is different. You just have to trace the data out in each and every one of them. Uh, does that answer your question or what you were getting at? Well, yeah. So he, here, here's my, and I don't know if you've ever heard of this or not, but for example, in the in the Vaticanus, which boasts itself of the oldest um, Greek text, you mm -hmm. have in, you have. I'm sorry, what? I mean, it's it's one of the oldest. Majuscule manuscripts is not the oldest manuscript by any means. Right, right. Well, you have th 300 to 350 roughly. And so you have in that text, all through there, you have things called emulots, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't know if I am or not. Uh, you know what I'm referring to? Yeah, yeah. And so all through there, you have these emulots next to uh verses where there are variant readings all throughout that text and specifically one i'll show you here and what they are if you can see that on there i don't have the slides but right there this reading happens to be first john 5 7 the johannine in common and all throughout the vaticanus we find these dots right next to variant readings that are found in for example, the Texas Receptus and, and those manuscripts. So this goes to show very strong evidence. In fact, there was a, an entire article written by uh, Philip Payne and Paul Kennard on this, and they came to the conclusion that there would have had to have been uh, another, a, a variant reading in these places where they put these emulots. So in my opinion, to say that these manuscripts, that these readings weren't available, you know, that these are somehow older readings that are more reliable and more trustworthy and these variant readings that are found in the TR don't find historical record, I just, I just don't buy that. There are clearly variant readings that were available at that time. For example, the Latin Vulgate, 
that was done in 382 by Jerome, it has no missing verses. Now, Jerome's not simply getting those verses out of thin air. He's getting those from, from manuscripts somewhere. And I just, I, go ahead. Let me ask you to clarify there. When you say the Latin Vulgate has no missing verses, what do you mean? Well, for example, all the, so out of the ESV, NIV, all of that, it's missing the 17 verses out of the New Testament. So there are 17 verses that are not in an NIV or ESV that are in the King James. Okay, but what does that have to do with the Latin Vulgate? I, I didn't follow what you meant when you say the Latin Vulgate has no missing verses. Okay, well, for example, all of the verses that are missing in the ESV, for example, are found in the Latin Vulgate. That was done in 382. Okay, so am I understanding you then to be saying that you think the Latin Vulgate is identical to the King James Bible? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, is to say that these translations, to say that the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, because of their age, well, they're the oldest and they don't have these verses, to say that I think is, is an error because you have other uh, uh, Bibles that were translated at that time, around in that same time period, that did contain those verses. And even in the Vaticanus, it, we find these emulots. And uh, if I'm pronouncing that, Ms. somebody's probably going to watch this later and be screaming the correct, correct pronunciation at me. But they have these dots beside them that are line up with all the variant readings. So these readings in the King James and the TR, they weren't just something that you know was just pulled out of oh, thin air. Yeah. There were, there were these readings there. So they have historical value. They're quoted by early church fathers. So to, for me, it's like saying, well, well, this is the oldest because, and, and this doesn't have those things. It doesn't have those verses or this reading in there. To me, that's just, it's an error because there are other ones that do. Yeah, I actually totally agree with most of what you just said there. And I think you actually just made my point. Um, because yes, every variant between the, the TR, I shouldn't say every variant, because the TR has some weird readings that have no manuscript support. Uh, but every true textual variant is a variant because we have witnesses that have different readings. Some have the reading, some don't have the reading. Sometimes a trend, an ancient translation like the Latin Vulgate will have a reading that's not found in any Greek manuscripts. Sometimes vice versa, that goes back and forth. Every variant has some support behind it. That's why we have variants. That's why we have uncertainty about, in those cases, which one is the original reading. That's literally, that's the point. There's data. That data disagrees with each other sometimes. That's not support for the King James in any way, shape, or form. It's support for the realization that the data sometimes points in towards one reading and other data supports a different reading. And that's not a new reality. Elijah Hickson delivered a marvelous paper at ETS a couple weeks ago where he showed exactly what you just pointed out through all the ancient manuscripts, not all, he, he took, I think, maybe about a dozen manuscripts from like 500 to 100 or something like that. And he showed how the scribes would note that there were textual variants. They, here's the, the takeaway from that. None of the scribes who produced those manuscripts were textual absolutists who said, this is the exact form of the word of God, don't question it. They were all admitting there are textual variants, and in those textual variants, we're not sure which reading is right, so here's a footnote to let you know about the other reading. Yeah, that's I absolutely agree with you. I just would say it's not in any way, shape, or form support for the King James Bible or the TR. Okay, well, so let me ask you this then. So why would, why would you say that, okay, there's variant readings, but we would take these ones and not the other ones? Well, that's the process that's called textual criticism, sitting down and looking at the data and sifting through it and saying, hey, okay, of this variant, so we've got these two different readings, here's the evidence for reading A, here's the evidence for reading B, if I put myself back in the situation to describe which one of these is most likely to have given rise to the others, which one's most likely original, and which one most likely is a scribal alteration. That's literally what textual critics do. I'm not a textual critic, but that's what textual critics do all day long, every day, is walk through every one of those places, look at all of the evidence from all of the manuscripts, all of the ancient translations, and all of the early church fathers' quotations, put all that data together and say, okay, here's the readings, here's the evidence for them, which one's most likely to have been original? That's, that's literally what they're doing. That's what Erasmus was doing. That's what the King James translators were doing. 
trying to figure out which readings were original. Mm -hmm. And so you would say that the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are most close to the originals? Uh, no, no, I wouldn't say that at all. I think they're closer than the TR. I wouldn't say they're the most close. Again, this idea, you keep mentioning those two manuscripts, and I know you said this in our last debate, this idea that modern translations are just based off those two manuscripts is, is just not true. Right. Yeah, I, I understand that, but, but they're based primarily off of those manuscripts. I, I wouldn't even say that that's necessarily true. They're, 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 I'll say this. Most modern textual critics, not all, there are different stripes of people doing textual criticism. Maurice Robinson does a very different kind of textual criticism than that which was done by the NA-28. The NA-28 textual criticism is very different from the new Tyndale House Greek New Testament. They're, they're all functioning differently. But I will say, apart from Robinson, most modern textual critics give more weight to those two early majuscules than they do to numerous later Byzantine minuscules. That, that's a fair thing to say. It's just certainly not true, though, that their text is basically the text of those two manuscripts or that they only follow those two manuscripts. That's just misunderstanding what's happening. As they're working through the data, they give more weight to those two manuscripts, yes, but not always only weight to those two manuscripts. They want to listen to all the data and, and mm -hmm. do their best to come to a conclusion about which reading was original. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'd have a couple questions from what you said there and, and what you said earlier. Uh, first, if it's true, and it is, as you just pointed out, scripts that worked through or produced various manuscripts had to wrestle with textual variants, and Erasmus had to wrestle with textual variants, like Acts 8.37, we just talked about that, he had to figure out, is this part of the original text or isn't it, and he made a decision, and the King James translators had to wrestle with textual variants, then upon what basis... Do you claim that the textual decisions that are behind the King James Bible are the right ones that can't be questioned? Like, I can defend each of my readings, as I'll admit uncertainty, but I can make a case and say, well, here's the evidence on this side, here's the evidence on that side. But you're just, your position just makes a blanket statement that the King James translators always made the right textual decision. And I, I'm just curious, what, what's your basis to say that? How would you defend that? Uh, how's the, what, what case would you make to say, here's why I believe the King James translators were always right when they made their textual decisions? Right. So this is where, and, and I know you called it an abracadabra Bible. Um, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word abracadabra. I would use the word inspired because this is where a measure of faith has to come in with the King James belief, especially of my stripe, because the King James translators, when they're looking at at you know the the very you know tons of TRs you know I think there were like 20 at the time of the translation of the King James Bible when they look down they see the variations between the TRs and when they see the variations between different manuscripts I I simply believe that there was an act of inspiration that happened and of course we get labeled all the time with double inspiration and not as in adding to the Word of God or you know some kind of new revelation. But I think that there was a supernatural guidance, inspiration in the translation process of the King James Bible. Because when you look at it from a, a, a human perspective and say, okay, what made them, from a, human, from, a, from a pure human perspective, you say, what made them choose this one? First John 2, 23 is the one I always like to use. Because you have no first John, the second half of first John 2, 23, you don't have that in any TR except for Bees' 1598 edition, but the King, that was so new and it had so little support that the King James translators still put it in italics because they didn't, you know, they didn't deem it, you know, uh, reliable enough uh, to say it was from the Greeks. That's why they put it in italics, the second half of 1 John 2.23. So to answer that question, why I think the King James translators always chose right because I think that the Lord had his hand directly in it. And so they just always made the right decision. Hmm. Okay. Well, so let me push back on two or three things there. Uh, first, just on first John two twenty three in particular. Um, I don't know if I'd be able to pull up images here quick enough, but so things were actually a little bit less straightforward in how they handled first John two twenty three. So the King James Bible is at its core, a revision of the 1602 bishops Bible. They took a 1602 Bishop's Bible, 
actually they had 40 copies of it that the king distributed. They divided it into six companies. Those six companies worked over their copies of the Bishop's Bible and crossed out things that they wanted to change, added things into the margin, wrote things in between the lines. I'll show you a picture here later if I can pull it up. Um, and, and came up with kind of a draft for what they what revisions they thought should be made to the text. Then they sent those revisions to the second stage of the work, which was a meeting at Stationers Hall in 1610, where 12 people went back over the text and decided which revisions to accept. So we have some draft work from the second Westminster Company as they were doing their revision in that first stage as a company. Um, they worked on the text of the epistles, including 1 John, and uh, we have their draft work. It's held at Lambeth Palace. It's called Lambeth Palace Manuscript 98. It's like a midway step between the Bishop's Bible text and the King James Bible text. That makes sense. As they're revising the Bishop's Bible text, this manuscript is a record of their work kind of halfway along the way. Uh, a couple months ago, actually almost a year ago now, I got to spend a whole day with Manuscript 98 um, at Lambeth Palace. It was just the coolest thing. It's just a piece of history. Like here's a handwritten text that the translators produced themselves as they were revising the Bishop's Bible. Well, 1 John 2.23 in that text, so that text has lots of readings that are different from the King James, marginal notes where they make up or they mark up questions about this or that reading. Uh, but 1 John 2.23 doesn't have any of that. Like nobody's even talking about it. And yet the handwriting is distinguishable as italics in the section that you're talking about that's in addition. Well, if we go back to the 1602 Bishop's Bible that they were working on, we find that the 1602 Bishop's Bible has exactly the same thing. No part of the text is changed. None of the italics are added. What that means is this. Insofar as our data allows us to see it, the King James translators barely looked at that verse. They didn't sit down and say, oh, we need to add this section even though we don't have manuscript data, so let's italicize it. They just copied what was in their 1602 Bishop's text at this point without any revision or any comment. Now, we don't know that they made no comment, but based on the evidence that we have available, we have no evidence that they made any careful decision there about what to do. They just repeated what was in their text in a what I would call a lazy moment. They just left it alone and didn't bother to change it or check it. Um, you are right. Some of their TRs had it. Uh, it's, it's not just one edition of Beza, if I remember correctly off the top of my head. I think there's three different editions of Beza that have it. Most of the other TRs don't. That's why in the 1602 Bishop's Bible it was italicized. But they didn't. From the evidence we have, they didn't. We can't say that they looked carefully at it and made a decision and were inspired by God. They just left what was in the 1602 and didn't change it in that spot. Is all that happened. If that kind of makes sense there. Now, I want to well, what, what's your what's your reference for that? Reference for what? What you just said. I mean, where did you read that? No, I examined the manuscript myself. I spent a, a day with their draft work at Lambeth Palace. So, so you. So you, you saw where the bishops, Bible, so you just think they just copied what the bishops Bible already had. I know that they did. I know what the bishops Bible has because I have a 1602 bishops Bible or PDFs of a 1602 bishops Bible. That's the draft that they were revising. I can see their draft work where they made no changes to the text. And the person who wrote out mm -hmm. manuscript 98 just wrote out the text of the bishops Bible there without change or alteration. And I can see the 1611 King James Bible that came to that text with no changes. Now, again, we don't have exhaustive data about every conversation that they had. But well, yeah, that's, so what I'm, that's, what I'm, that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, to make it sound like it was just for you to say so authoritatively that they were just copying it down exactly how it was written. I mean, to say that they didn't look at it and and deliberate whether it should or should not be in the in, in the King James Bible. I mean, I'm not saying that they had a big conversation about it, but I think to say that there was no conversation about it either, you just can't say that. Yeah, well, that's why what I would I wouldn't say I know they had no conversation. I would say insofar as the data we have lets us see it, we have no indication that they made some careful, reasoned, certainly not inspired choice about that text. They just left what was in the 1602. Now, let me, if I can, share another example that I think would even illuminate that even better. So not just about manuscripts 98, but you're saying as they made their textual decisions, they were guided by the Holy Spirit. What would you do in a place where they disagreed? where one group comes to one textual reading and another group comes to another textual reading, which one of them is inspired. And in how the, would you know? The, like the King James committees? Yeah, so the King James Bible was created, it's a revision of the Bishop's Bible that was created in basically three steps. 
in the first step, they divided into six committees, and each committee took a mm -hmm. portion of the biblical text. In mm -hmm. the second step, their draft work was sent to London, and at Stationers Hall in London in 1610, they worked over the whole Bible. And then in the third step, two final revisers, uh, Miles Smith and Thomas Bilson, went over the whole text and made a few other tweaks. So, so if the King James translators disagreed with each other between those two steps or between the two companies, how did they know words, which one to pick? No, no. How do you know which one's inspired? Were the company's work inspired? Were the revisers' works inspired? Were Smith and Bilson inspired when they corrected the revisers? Was Bancroft inspired when he came along and made his final tweaks? Or did all of them get it wrong and it was the printer, whatever he printed, that was inspired? Where, where does the inspiration happen and how do you know? We'll see. We'll see. And that's the thing about inspiration. I mean, I'll read you a few things about inspiration here from, uh, hang on a second, let me get it pulled up here. Uh, let's see here. Okay, I'll read you a few. Uh, Lewis Galson says this, were we asked then how this work of divine inspiration was accomplished in the men of God, we should reply that we do not know. Lewis Schaefer said about inspiration, the doctrine of inspiration, because it is supernatural, presents some problems to human understanding. Henry C. Thesis says, accepting the above as the best definition of inspiration, we observe that we do not know the mode of inspiration. I mean, just as mysterious as inspiration was, I mean, we, we can't figure out where it happened exactly. All I know is this, is that the finished product of the King James Bible, and, and to say that there was like all these different, you know, variants made, people don't have to know they're under inspiration, nor do we have to pin down the exact moment of inspiration to know that it happened. So to say that the, you know, when it exactly did it happen, well, I can't tell you when it happened in the whole process, but through the process, I believe that God had his hand in the King James Bible and that the finished product is inspired. Um, so, hey guys, I'm sorry. Yeah. It, yeah, if you said Andrew and Timothy, you can do the same thing. Can you both just maybe give like a clear definition of inspiration just so we can kind of understand a little bit more from where you're coming from? Yeah. So so for the purposes of this debate, because I've wanted to stick to what the Bible, the King James Bible text itself says, I would say inspiration refers to the process by which the Holy Spirit first breathed out scripture when he gave it. Uh, so it, it refers to that process of God giving scripture. A later translator, in my opinion, cannot be inspired. A later copyist cannot be inspired. Inspiration, by definition, is the giving of new revelation. So if we're going to call the King James translators inspired, then what we mean is God gave a third testament. No, I think your I think your definition of inspiration is in, is is very off, especially in light of Scripture. The word inspiration, okay. well, the word inspiration only appears twice in the Bible. The first time is Job thirty two eight. There's a spirit in man, in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth him understanding. So inspiration technically What's the other doesn't Second Timothy three sixteen. Can we look at that one? Sure. Or but you could probably me, quote it. Yeah, well let me finish what I'm saying about Job thirty two eight. So the inspiration happens in the spirit of man. There's a spirit of man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth him understanding. So inspiration technically doesn't even happen on the paper if we're gonna get technical. Inspiration happens in the spirit of man to give him the understanding of what to put on the paper. And to say that the King James translators, if they were indeed were inspired, then, you know, at the later time, there'll be a third testament. Well, that's not true. Inspiration happens every time that God illuminates a truth out of the Bible because the, the inspiration happens inside of man to give him, un, that gives him understanding. So, you have 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And to say that that inspiration only happened in the originals, uh, but go ahead with what you were going to say with 2 Timothy 3.16. Yeah, no, so just 
to, to clarify one thing, I, I don't think the text in Job is talking about inspiration in the sense that I mean uh, special revelation. Second Timothy 3.16 certainly is. It's not the only text in the Bible that talks about inspiration. It just happens to be the only text that in the King James Bible uses the word inspiration. But here's what we need to understand about that text if we're going to build a case just within the King James Bible and what the King James Bible says. There was a debate and has long been a debate about what that text actually means. So in Greek, that whole phrase, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, that's, that big long phrase is just three words, pasa, grafe, theopneustos, all scripture, God breathed. So when a translator comes to that text, he has to make a bunch of interpretive decisions. There's no verb there. Where are you going to put the verb in? Should it be all in scripture inspired? Uh, all, all scripture inspired is profitable because the, ne the next word there is profitable, or should it be all scripture is inspired and profitable? You got to make a decision there. But then there was a debate and continues even to this day to be a debate. Is this passage talking about how scripture in the present functions, or is this passage talking about how the original wording of scripture was first given? So a translator's got to decide which ways of those he's going to handle the text. Here's what's fascinating. The King James Bible translators made a specific decision, and they actually made some minor changes to the, the Bode 1602 text here. They made a specific decision in how to translate the text. They translated it, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That phrase, is given by, is not present in the Greek text. That's their interpretive decision, and they're landing on one side of that debate, and they're specifically saying, we believe that inspiration refers to the original giving of scripture, not to its present function. So to say, well, the Bible teaches that inspiration is this ongoing thing that happens in the heart of men. Well, you're just not reading your Bible close enough. My Bible might be, could use to be said that, but the King James Bible can't be used to say that because the King James translators made a very specific choice there and defined inspiration as referring to the giving of scripture. So that if inspiration is happening, then new scripture is being given. Does that make so sense? Well, I mean, uh, Andrew, I, I, I'll, I'll let you respond to that, Andrew. Uh, then we're going to have to go to, to closing statements, and we're going to start uh, winding down after that. But uh, go ahead and respond to that, Andrew. Okay. Well, I, I would disagree with the fact that the inspiration only is, is the giving of Scripture. I think it also would have to apply to— Okay, let me ask you this. Do you think that Scripture is only in the originals? No, I, I already made a long 10-minute case for why I think God's word, even when the wording gets changed in transmission, is still God's word. He still speaks through okay. it. Okay, and so and you believe that the original, okay, do you believe the originals, though, are, are perfect? No errors in them? I believe the original wording was perfect, yes. With no errors in the originals? Yeah, there was no errors in the original wording of the text as God inspired it. Okay, so in order for us to have something that is given by inspiration. So can I say that this King James Bible is given by inspiration? Well, that word given means that it's referring to how it was given. Okay, but can, can, can I hold a book right now and say this is given by inspiration? Well, do you see what you're doing there? You're wanting to hold a book and say it's inspired, but that's not what your text says. Your text says given. Well hang, well, hang on. Well, I, I, well, we'll get to the text in a second, but I want you to answer the question. Can I, in your opinion, hold a, a, a book in my hand and say this is given by inspiration? Yeah, you can hold an ESV and say it was given by inspiration. An NIV, it was given by inspiration. All of them are the Bible, which was first given by inspiration. But I thought you just said that only the originals were given by inspiration. <laughs> That's what the word given means. It means God first spoke this out by inspiration. Okay, so when I hold in my hand the inspired word of God, but they all read differently, which one is inspired and which one is not? That's why we have to come to the question and say, which one of these reflects the original wording? Okay, and you would say the ESV reflects the original word. What I'm getting at is in, in verse 15 is that you have the Holy Scriptures, and Timothy had the Holy Scriptures in his hand. Yeah, and then in the, very next, in the very next verse, he says, all Scripture is. So the Scriptures that Timothy had, which was not the originals, it was copies of copies of copies of copies, those scriptures were given by. So, in in the same context where we find 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The very the verse right before it, Timothy had a copy of those scriptures in his hand. Yeah. And he had an imperfect copy and it was still the word of God. But see, that's that's where I mean you're just gonna disagree. I don't think that a imperfect Bible can be called a inspired Bible in the preserved word of God. I mean, for example, we had this conversation last time with the ESV. Do you think that Mark 1, 2 is a better reading than, than, uh, than the King James reading where it says in Isaiah the prophet when one of those is clearly not in Isaiah? Yeah, we hashed that out at great length last time. I think whatever the original wording is is what we should stick by. But Okay, but wait a second. What is the original wording? Well, the evidence in that case seems to pretty strongly favor the ESV form as being the original wording. Okay, so you would say, and, and this is what, and, and I know we hashed this out immensely last time, but this is where it all boils down to. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. That is not found anywhere in Isaiah. So what you have now is God inspiring errors in a text. I wouldn't say that in the slightest. Okay, well then what would you say concerning that? I would say that you're wanting to call something an error that just simply isn't an error. And we have plenty of examples of composite uh, quotations in the New Testament that do Where? that kind of thing. That okay, name two one. Text together. Name, name one. <laughs> Give me a moment and I'll pull it up. I, I didn't think we were going to okay. re revisit this text um, or that issue. Uh, but here... So for uh, after, example, after Timothy, after you after you find an example, uh, yeah, Timothy, wouldn't you find an example? And that's fine. Uh, let's let Andrew make his point with that, and then we'll go to closing statements. All right. Okay. Sure. Oh, so am I waiting for Andrew to answer, or am I? No, we're waiting on you to show one example oh, yeah. where the New Testament ever does that in another place. Well, the New Testament combines quotations like that all the time. I think what you're wanting to say is find another quotation that makes it sound like it just comes from one source when it actually comes from two. Is that what you're asking? Well, I mean, it does. it's not sounding like – it literally says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. Okay. You and I both know that that's just not in Isaiah. Well, let me ask you about this text then. So Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Um, Matthew quotes an Old Testament text. And it says, And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written, notice, by the prophet. So it's a written text by the prophet, and he quotes the prophet. What and verse? And what verse? Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Mm -hmm. He's quoting the prophet. And there's two things I want to say in response to. This is just one because this is an example I pulled up here. And now he quotes the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Can you find that text for me in Micah? Okay. Here's the problem, though. What? No, you cannot. Why not? Okay, because I'm going to show you. ready? I'm going to show you why. Because the chief priests... Were they misquoted the verse. Notice, this is not the Bible quoting the Bible. And they said unto him, this is the chief priest, and they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judah, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art thou not the least among the princes of Judah. They were purposely lying uh, to uh, Herod here. This is not the Bible quoting the Bible. This is the chief priest quoting the Bible. Yeah, I don't think they're misquoting the Bible, but sure, if you want to say that. So let me ask you this. I just went through in my 10-minute presentation at the beginning a dozen examples where Paul and Jesus quoted the Bible and made much bigger changes to their text than Mark made to, from your understanding, made in his quotation of Malachi or Isaiah, is Isaiah 40 or Malachi 3, I can't remember which. But let me ask you this. So were they making an error? I do not believe so. But the same logic that you're forcing me to say means Mark was in error, should force you to say that Paul and Jesus are in error. And my point is that Paul and Jesus aren't in error. Your logic is. I don't think my logic is because when you have New Testament passages being given, quoting Old Testament passages, and, and this is where my view of King James onlyism 
uh, you know, gets a little extreme for some people. You have an example of Isaiah chapter 36, where God is giving that, Jeremiah writes it down. You have the original, the first original was lost. God then tells him to go back and add more. So I think that when God is writing, when they are writing these passages, and there are certain places, and of course we don't have time to get into it tonight, but there are places where there are differences when they quote unquote misquote New Testament, uh, excuse me, Old Testament passages in the New Testament, they are making doctrinal shifts. For example, when Paul takes verses clearly out of context in the Old Testament and applies them to New Testament truths, you have a very famous one, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that Old Testament text is found in um, uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 32, but it says they are delivered, and it's from reference to the day of the Lord. But Paul takes that Old Testament passage, misquotes it, for exa as you would say, and makes a New Testament application out of it. I think that happens many times, and I think that's simply God doing what he wants to with his own word. But we find it within the confines of Scripture. What we never see, though, is, for example, what the ESV does or the other the other modern Bibles, completely leaving out whole verses. And you say, well, they weren't there in the oldest and best. But we find the oldest and best. For example, the the a woman caught in adultery. That whole story. If you go to an ESV or an NIV or a Holcomb Christian Standard, they've got. I mean, even the Holcomb Christian Standard has an entire box around it. But what you have in Vaticanus that leaves those verses out, you have one of those emulots found right there in John 7, 52, showing that there were other variant readings that had those. And I simply, I, my faith falls with the uh, Andrew, Bible. we're, we're going to go to uh, closing statements now, uh, and you can, you, you can okay. tease that out. Like, so like, we, and you can, you can finish up that argument in your closer if you want. Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll let you uh, go first. Yeah, we'll, we'll just hit. Five minute uh, closing statements because yeah, sorry, we're just uh, uh, closer. Well, since I, I since I opened direct, since, since I opened out since I opened since I opened, don't I get to close? Sure, I, I can go first if you'd like as far as closing statements. Okay, you can do it that way if Timothy's okay with that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine by me. So for my closing, we get five minutes. Is that right? Five minutes? Yeah, yeah. If, yeah. If you, if, so, uh, if, you're good, a, if you're good with that, Timothy, uh, if you're okay with that, then you go. Yeah, that works for me. As a closing argument, I would want to point out two or three things. First, I'd like to suggest that the approach that Andrew has tried to take, and I, I love him, and I respect him, and I have no doubt in my mind that he's driven to his position by a love for the Bible. And I think most of the people who hold a position like his are driven to their position by a love for the Bible, but they have at heart a deep skepticism that makes them think that the Bible's lost unless they have one particular form of it that they can trust. They've got to have one copy, one translation, one form that's unquestioned and unquestionable or else they don't have a Bible. So he leans towards the King James Bible and it's a natural impulse. It's just unhistorical can't be documented by evidence, and I think is patently unbiblical. And I say it's unbiblical for the two reasons that I sketched out to start with. First, because a biblical theology of Scripture over, overall would teach us that copies of the Bible are always going to be imperfect, and yet that God's Word is strong enough that imperfect copies do not mean that God's voice is lost. But then secondly, the second part of my argument, which has almost not been addressed by Andrew except just now, and he may say more about it in his closing, I think that if we take that approach that says, oh, Mark 1, 2 is an error, they changed this. Oh, this is an error over here because this verse has been changed. Uh, so I'll grant you, there are two major textual variants that are 12 verses each, the story of the woman caught in adultery in the last 12 verses of Mark. Apart from that, there's maybe 50 or 60 textual variants that contain one to two whole verses. That's what we're talking about at that level. All the rest of the textual variants in the Bible are smaller than a single verse, and they're exactly the same kind of thing that I demonstrated over and over again happens even within the King James Bible as Paul quotes the text or Peter quotes the text or Jesus quotes the text. There are minor changes in the text. And if you want to come and throw a fit about every one of those and say, oh, well, that's an error. They're changing the verse. They're taking this out. They're taking that out. Mark 1, 2 says Isaiah, but the other one doesn't. That's if you took that attitude and that approach, 
and you used it on exactly the same Bible that Jesus and the apostles had in front of them, according to the King James Bible, then you would end up condemning Jesus and the apostles in the same way that you're condemning the NIV. If you got your highlighter out and highlighted every word that was different and changed, every clause that was added, every clause that was deleted, every time they cut God out or cut the Lord out, then you're left with the position that's forced to condemn Jesus. And I'd urge us all to listen to the voice of the Spirit and to realize, if that's my approach, and that's where it takes me, then there's something wrong with my approach. There's something wrong with my core mentality, the abracadabra Bible, that makes me think I've got to have a perfect text and it can't differ from the King James. And so I would say, at the end of the day, that approach, that entire approach, is fundamentally unbiblical and doesn't faithfully follow Jesus. That's that's my closing. No, Andrew. Okay. Um, in in my closing statement, I want to just talk about and address what he's saying about the variations. Can a man get saved out of a NIV? Sure. Uh, any anybody who who is a soul winner can lead somebody to the Lord using an NIV. You can. I mean, I've seen people give gospel presentations using a Catholic Bible. John R. Rice was one of them. Um, to say that that people can't get saved out of an NIV or an ESV is something I've never said. I've never believed. There are people out there who believe that. But also on the flip side to say, though, that the changes that are made in these modern translations or the variations, I should say, because I would say they're changes. Those on the other side would just say variations. But the variations or changes that are made, when you begin to look at them, it's not minor. You begin to see errors. For example, you have the Mark 1-2. You begin to look at uh, 2 Samuel 21, uh, where you have uh, the italicized words, the brother of, being left out. And now you have Elhanan killing Goliath instead of uh, he killed the brother of Goliath. Over and over, you find those things. When you look at the doctrinal implications of the of the changes that take place, the verses that are left out. For example, when Acts chapter number 8, where you have the man making his profession of faith in Jesus Christ prior to his baptism, that com being completely left out. When you begin to really study and look at what the changes are, then in my opinion... I think that they are much more serious than just saying, well, there's just a few changes that are made. When you have the blood being left out in Colossians 1.14, when you have all the God being left out of the greatest verse on the incarnation, uh, you know, God was manifest in the flesh, simply saying he. Uh, when you have, uh, for example, uh, I just found this one today looking through 1 Cor uh, Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, talking about the second Adam, or excuse me, the last Adam, I should say. And uh, verse 44, uh, your King James Bible, oops. you know, just a second. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44, you have, uh, um, excuse me, verse 45, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Uh, uh, the first man, verse 47, was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. So there in the King James, you have the second is the Lord from heaven. You have all these removals of the, of the, uh, of the title of deity all throughout the Bible. And so I think that there is an agenda. I do think Westcott and Horde, of course, being extremely wicked heretics, neither one of them are in heaven unless they got saved without anybody knowing. Uh, neither one of them are in heaven. Both of them haters of the TR, haters of God's word. Um, corruptors, no doubt, they clearly had an agenda. You studied their life, you studied their writings, they clearly had an agenda. And I think that that agenda creeped out, and it's now seen in the modern translations, and I think it's only going to get worse as we see more and more uh, revisions done. I think the modern translations done nothing but cause confusion for 200, and over 250 years we have unification around one book that produced the greatest revivals, the greatest men, the greatest preachers, uh, and now we see uh, the condition of the church age now with the modern translation movement. So I think uh, I think that I believe very strongly 
that when you begin to look at these variations and you begin to look at what the differences are, I think that a man will conclusively say that the King James is a superior text to the modern translations, and it is much more, much more of a doctrinal book. You find much stronger cases for doctrine in the King James than the modern translations. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for your time today. That was an amazing little feisty debate. Sorry about all the technical difficulties we've had. Um, any closing thoughts from my two co-hosts? Um, I just want to thank both of the gentlemen for coming on. Yeah, um, thank you guys um, for coming on. And then also David. Um, David, thank you for allowing me to kind of moderate a little bit. I appreciate it. Um, first time I ever did something like this. So, hey, I'm really thankful. I think um, Timothy is a very intelligent guy. I follow him a lot on Facebook. I follow Andrew, your ministry on Facebook. And seems like you're doing a really good job pastoring the church. Yeah, North Carolina, and you guys are coming on. Really appreciate it. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Well, again, thanks, guys. And uh, as uh, Mr. Andrew would say, love them to Jesus. Amen. All right. Take care, guys. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.